no grand entrance for her creative head says that there would only be a backdoor welcome for Chris Aquino. A lot of people say that when a door of opportunity closes, another one will open. But it seems that backdoor was the one that opened for the queen of all media after she transferred to the rival network of her home network for 20 years. Jake Tortosillas, the creative head of the GMA network stated that Chris won't be receiving any grand welcome in the network. Apparently, the queen of all media had entered through the back door. Todd Asilos also added that he's wishing that Chris would hopefully end e, a place at TCNN. Invite you to watch the video. Gabriela Rep, DeLima should resign read the full story here. After Senator Leela DeLima's shocking revelation on her past relationship with her driver, Ronnie Dean, who had allegedly transported money and drugs for her inside the National Penitentiary, the senator is under fire this time from the party list of women in the Congress. The Gabriella Women's Party has spoken up about the issue and slammed Delima for using her gender in defending her case. They stated, So-called frailties of women, even men or any gender for that matter, can never be seen as a defense for crimes, be it adultery, abuse of authority by a public official or drug trafficking. It should not be used especially by one who holds a position of power like Senator Leela de Lima as an excuse from criminal accountability or to paint herself as a victim. Gabriela Representative Lesbaminda Lagan further said, she should quit or resign from the Senate because what she did was unethical, immoral and definitely wrong. She should not use being a woman and she should not use other women as an excuse that she was weak at Maranian frailty. Invite you to watch the video. Philippines' GDP rises up to 7.1 percent, the fastest-growing economy among Asian emerging markets. It looks like the Philippines' economic growth has gone beyond everybody's expectation. The country's economy grew by 7.1 percent in the third quarter of the year which, according to the National Economic and Development Authority, is the fastest among Asian markets. In a briefing at the Heritage Hotel Manila, Policy and Planning Under Secretary Rosemary Giadillon pointed out that the growth is above the median market expectation of 6.8 percent. She added that the country gained the highest growth rate, compared to China's 6.7 percent, Vietnam's 6.4 percent, Indonesia's 5.0 percent, and Malaysia's 4.3 percent. According to the Philippine Statistics Authority, the third quarter's output was due to the expansion of the services sector with 6.9 percent and industry with 8.6 percent. Not only that, per capita GDP grew by 5.3 percent and per capita national gross income by 4.6 percent. The statistics quoted that both are higher than the respective growth last year. Idyllin was optimistic, saying reaching the full-year growth target would not be that difficult. The country simply needs to grow 3.4 percent growth to achieve the target range of 6.0 percent. Similar to the country's economic growth, the investments within the country are continuously growing. It went from the record 4.0 percent last year, to today's 16.2 percent. According to Adelin, public investment in infrastructure remains strong, with public construction growing to 20 percent for this quarter. Invite you to watch the video. Buy Libra drug money, NBI still waiting for AMLC records. Justice Secretary Vitaliano Aguirre before the congressional hearing and inquiry on illegal drug trade in National Buy Libra Prison, October 10, 2016 Nino Jesus or Beta Philippine Daily Inquirer, Justice Secretary Vitaliano Aguirre. Nino Jesus or Beta Inquirer file photo. Justice Secretary Vitaliano Aguirre II is furious that the Banco Central NG Pilipinas, BSP, and the Anti-Money Laundering Council, AMLC, have withheld vital bank information on new by Libid prison, NBP, drug operations sought by the National Bureau of Investigation nearly two years ago. Aguirre said that up to now, the BSP and the AMLC appear to be protecting people or groups involved in the drug trade as insinuated by President Rodrigo Duterte himself when he lashed out at the two agencies in a speech during the NBI anniversary on Monday. Yes, the BSP AMLC gave bank documents shortly after he castigated them in his speech. But the bank documents it gave were only for the narco generals that we asked five months ago. The bank documents involving the NBP drug operations have not been submitted up to now, he said in a phone interview on Thursday. Advertisement
Aguirre said that when he met recently with the BSP governor and AMLC chair, Amando M. Tatanko Jr., he was surprised to learn that the NBI had requested bank documents of NBP drug lords, including Herbert Colango, Peter Company, and J.B. Sebastian, as early as January 2015, who were a month after then-Justice Secretary Leela de Lima led the raid on the maximum security prison. Criminal negligence? But up to now, the NBI is still waiting for these bank documents even after getting a tongue lashing from the president. This is already criminal negligence, he said. The secretary said the bank transactions sought by the NBI could have boosted the case build-up against the convicted drug lords and ended the illegal drug trade before the end of the Aquino administration. While the BSP and the AMLC claimed that they could not act because of the bank secrecy law, Aguirre argued that since these bank deposits involved suspicious transactions and were considered a predicate crime, the dirty money watchdogs should have taken the initiative to gather the documents and submit them to the NBI as early as January last year. Aguirre contrasted the BSP and the AMLC's reluctance to help authorities go after drug lords and other money launderers with their enthusiasm in readily providing bank data of political enemies of the previous administration including the late Chief Justice Renato Corona and former Vice President Jajomar Bine. Due to rage, in a speech, the president called the two agencies garbage and accused them of protecting somebody, those who are really into money laundering. I will call for you and you have to answer so many questions to me. You choose either we cooperate in this government as a republic to protect and preserve our people or do not make it hard for us, otherwise I will make it hard for you. There are billions stashed there in the banks, we're really being washed or just being kept there in the meantime. Go to the Secretary of Justice, the AMLC guys, explain to us in public or I will do the explaining for you. Choose, the President said. Mr. Dudard also alluded to a big-time drug lord who laundered P5.1 billion in dirty money in just one day under the noses of the BSP and the AMLC. Invite you to watch the video. First world leader to meet with Trump, Japan's Shinzo Abe, comes seeking reassurance. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe on Thursday became the first foreign head of state to meet face-to-face -face with Donald Trump since the election. Afterward, Abe described the meeting as really cordial and said he believed he would be able to establish a relationship of trust. Abe said he conveyed his views on basic issues during the meeting, but declined to provide further details. I do believe that without confidence between the two nations the alliance would never function in the future and as the outcome of today's discussion, I am convinced Mr. Trump is a leader in whom I can have great confidence," Abe said. Abe had been expected to press the president-elect on how much of his bluster was campaign rhetoric or actual policy. Before flying in from Japan, Abe said he was thrilled to be the first foreign leader to get an audience with Trump. The Japan-U.S. alliance is the axis of Japan's diplomacy and security, Abe told reporters in Tokyo. The alliance becomes alive only when there is trust between us. I would like to build such a trust with Mr. Trump. Behind the polite words lies deep trepidation. Japan was one of the countries most rattled by Trump's upset victory in the November 8 election. During the campaign, Trump accused Japan of essentially freeloading off the United States by not paying sufficiently for the 54,000 U.S. troops stationed there, in fact it pays about $1.7 billion a year, and then stunned the Japanese by saying they should build a nuclear weapon to protect themselves against nuclear-armed North Korea. There is real existential shock here, said Sheila Smith, a Japan expert with the Council on Foreign Relations who is currently in Tokyo. It was just unbelievable to them that a presidential candidate would call into question the defense treaty. They didn't know if these comments made by then-presidential candidate Trump were real or campaign rhetoric. After Japan's defeat in World War II, the United States directed the writing of a pacifist constitution that kept the country dependent on U.S. power for its defense. Although that constitution has been weakened by Abe, a nationalist who wants to bolster his country's defense forces, the Japanese population remains deeply opposed to nuclear weapons, as the only people in the world ever to have been attacked with them. The Japanese also have been worried about Trump's stance against free trade, especially his opposition to President Obama's Trans-Pacific Partnership. Nevertheless, another Japan expert believes that Trump and Abe, 
both avowed conservatives, might get along better than expected in person. If you bear in mind how right-leaning the Abe administration has been Trump's election has opened an opportunity for Abe to push through measures to fortify Japan militarily and become more assertive, said Ra Mason, a Japan specialist at the University of East Anglia. Trump adviser Kellyanne Conway described the meeting Thursday at Trump Tower in New York City as a chance for the two to get acquainted. We are very sensitive to the fact that President Obama is still in office for the next two months, and we won't be making diplomatic agreements today, she told reporters. The meeting also comes at a time that Trump's foreign policy, especially with regard to Asia, remains very much a work in progress. Trump has yet to name a Secretary of State. His Asia advisers, Michael Pillsbury, a former Defense Department official, and Peter Navarro, an economist, are more focused on China than other areas of Asia. Many traditional Republicans in foreign policy have blasted Trump's ideas about weakening the defense alliances that date to the end of World War II. In short, if the Trump brand becomes America's brand, we can expect ruinous marginalization in Asia and unwanted compliance with rules which the Chinese and other challengers set, a group of eight former Asia specialists who served past Republican administrations wrote in an open letter in mid-August. However, Trump does appear to be taking advice on foreign policy. On Thursday, ahead of the Abe meeting, Trump met with former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger. According to a statement from Trump's transition team, they discussed China, Russia, Iran, the EU and other events and issues around the world. Thank you for watching videos. You remember the likes and comments below. Thanks.